That's good. Thanks, Gabby. Um, that's the two great um, accompanying testimonies there, and I want you to piece those two together. All right, keep those two together because uh, we've got the fresh one and um, uh, that interesting thing of... You know, I said if, uh, probably a couple of months ago now that there's an air of healing over the place. Now, that happens. It's not like, oh, I prayed for healing and it didn't work. God doesn't work in... Well, he does work all sorts of ways, but generally, generally speaking an air of healing or a spirit of healing rests over a place or God's presence, to use a more biblical term, God's Holy Spirit provides a presence for healing. See, in a few places in scripture it, it uses the term uh, the Holy Spirit was present for healing. Now that seems strange to us, isn't you know, isn't God's Holy Spirit present all the time? Well, yeah, he's everywhere, he's present. But there's a time where he provides an opportunity for healing. Now, a while ago, there, was, there began an opportunity for healing for emotional upheaval, whatever, you know, depression, that kind of thing. Well, I believe we've shifted now and there's an, uh, uh, God is present for healing for physical things. So, which is quite exciting because that's more outward and you can see that and people jump up and down and with excitement and that kind of thing. Mind you, people can get pretty excited when healed of depression. Uh, that can cause quite a bit of um, uh, silly laughter and, and carry on. So uh, that gets a bit unruly as well. Um, so it seems, you know, just trying to track what God's doing here. But that's one thing, right? There's, a, there's like a, a time for healing that God provides. And don't worry if you miss one because another one's soon coming behind it. Right? But when something happens like that, then take the opportunity. Say, well, maybe God will heal my back. Right? Because that's what God did. You were over there. <laughs> now you've moved over. But maybe that's what God did over there. So I might give it a go too. So jump on board with things like that when it happens because you, that's why we, we're supposed to share it, because it's at that time when healing can be passed on. So it's interesting. Now, I don't know exactly how it works, but that's the way it seems to work. The other important thing from Joy's testimony is that soon after your physical healing or emotional healing, there will be a quick follow-up of pain. Because the devil will try to convince you that the healing wasn't real or complete. And you'll get a twinge. You may have experienced that a bit of a twinge and, oh, what's going on there? That's the time to say, thank you, God, for my healing that I have received. And often that will just finish things off for you. Like Joy's experienced that. Whenever she, every now and then she'll feel a bit of that pain and as soon as she enters into thanksgiving or, or prayer following that, then the, uh, the healing, if you like, is refreshed and restored. Um, one of the big dangers in healing that people do is to they think, oh, I'm healed now and they go away. Right? I, I've seen lack of thankfulness is a real danger for people because when you don't come back and thank God then you can pretty much guarantee that the difficulty re will return not so much the same difficulty but often other difficulty happens. Now, I'm not saying that it's a curse from God. I'm just saying that's what I've noticed in people's lives and, uh, and other people who are much more experienced than in the area of prayer than I am have said that lack of thankfulness is a real danger and can see you in more hot water than you were before. And I've seen that too. So, so remember to, uh, to come back and give thanks to God uh, because... You know, he longs for us to worship him. That's his ultimate healing. Ultimate healing is when we give up on ourselves and place our everything at the feet of the Lord and thank him for everything. And that's when we truly are blessed. So, with that little summing up and teaching opportunity, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. 
that you are such a loving and healing and gracious God. Uh, and we pray now that as, as we begin this message about vine and branches, that you would bring healing through us to our nation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What I want to talk about is horticulture. Um, this, this reading from, from John where, that Gabby had there before, vine and branches, and there's, there's more of that too, what I'm looking at today. Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Um, yeah. And then in, from verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown... No, if you do not remain in me, not if you remain, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Um, this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So, do you get it? Um, just for those online, two, there you go. There's a, what is it? Bear, apple. Bear apple, you reckon? Bear fruit. Yes. Look at that. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Bear fruit. Right. He's just helping me get this message across. We're called to bear fruit. A lot of people make that mistake. They think that Jesus died on the cross so that we could be saved. That's not quite right. He died on the cross so that we could have life. There's a difference. The life that he has for us is a life of service, a life of fruitfulness, a life of usefulness, a, a, a new destiny, a new purpose, new hope, life in its fullness. That's what he has for us. He, he saved us so we could bear fruit. We have trouble with that in the church today, I think. See, nowhere in scripture does Jesus call us to salvation. You know when Jesus went around talking to people? He didn't say, be saved. Never. He said, be healed or, you know, go and sin no more or something like that. Or your faith has saved you. That's the closest he gets. He doesn't call anyone to salvation. He calls them to follow. And there's a difference, a huge difference. We're called to bear fruit. You know, it's a real worry for me as a pastor because I'm given the responsibility to lead a church. But lead a church in what? In our salvation? Well, yeah, it's nice to bring people to salvation. But no, I'm supposed to lead people in their ministry. Each one of you has a ministry. Each one of you is called to follow Christ. And it's a concern for me when I see people not stepping into the destiny that God has for them. Um, I'm not saying here that you've got to do a certain amount before you can be saved. No, that's not the message. It's because you are saved, because you are a child of God, you have a purpose, you have a destiny. See, we've been, we've been let in on the Father's business. And that's a blessing. Like, if you're an heir, that means that you are going to inherit everything from your father, right, in ancient terms. Right? That means the father's business becomes your business by right, by birthright. 
by right of your relationship with the Father. So if you were, you know, if your dad was head of a huge corporation like Coca-Cola or something, then your birthright is rather large, isn't it? You have been let in on that business simply because you were born into that family. Like not because you are particularly smart or highly skilled or anything, but simply because you were born into that family. So, and there's heaps of movies around where the, you know, the son comes along and he's the heir of the great fortune and he's an idiot and you know, messes it all up. There's heaps of stories like that. Um, and there's heaps of stories too where the, the father doesn't let the son take over you know, even though he's got all these good innovative ideas, that's, that's another angle on that story. But this story, your story, is that you are a child of the Most High God and you, are, you have been given by virtue of your new birth in Christ a role in the family business. This family business is bigger than Coca-Cola. This family business is cosmic in proportion. This family business is about the renewal of creation. This family business is about the salvation of mankind, the restoration of your community, the healing of your community. That's the family business and you have been given responsibility in that family business by virtue of who you are in Christ, by your relationship with the Father. It's given to you. That means there's a calling for us, there's a responsibility for us that we have before us. And we need to find out what that is. We need to step into that for full and rich blessing. That, that can be a bit scary, can't it? We think, well, how do we do that? Let's, before we get too far down the track of our imaginations, let's get back to Scripture and see what Jesus is saying. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. So if we keep in Jesus, if we keep finding out who he is in our lives, what he's doing in our lives, the closer we get to Jesus, the more we're going to see that fruit come out in our lives he uses these horticultural terms of vine and branches and so you know what are, what are grape vines do has anyone here got grape vines I don't know if it's a Queensland thing nobody okay um, I was born in Loxton in South Australia right now Loxton was a soldier settlement that's what they called it so World War II returned servicemen uh, were given the op opportunity to work a 25 acre block, 20 to 25 acres um, and that was a, uh, we called them fruit blocks. So there was a block of land that was sectioned off and it was irrigated. Now because in Loxton it doesn't rain but you've got the Murray River flow flowing through it and they put in these locks to slow the water down so that they could use the water to grow fruit. And they planted up fruit trees, such as oranges and apricots. And, uh, fantastic. You'd, uh, you know, I'd get jobs, uh, get a job during the school holidays picking apricots and um, doing all sorts of other stupid things. But that's, you know, it was a good way for kids to earn money and we also learnt how to prune grapevines. Because uh, you need to prune grapevines. When I went to Rockhampton, there was a, a guy there who had grapevines. He was actually also from the Riverland in South Australia. And he was growing this grapevine. And he said, w you know, do you know anything about grapevines? I said, oh, a little bit. And he said, well, mine's not producing any fruit. Do you know why? And I said, well, not just offhand. I'd have to see it. But, you know, have you pruned it? He said, no, I don't know how to prune I'm thinking, dude, you're from the Riverland, you don't know how to prune a grapevine. But anyway, uh, I'm not here to judge. So I went round to his place 
And he had this beautiful grapevine and it's growing all along his fence. Going really well. And I said, oh, how old is it? He said, three years. Okay, I could see the problem. A grapevine, three-year-old grapevine should not be that big. All of its energy was going into the wood and leaves and so there was nothing left for the fruit. So I said, we need to trim it back. He said, oh, but I like it along the fence. So anyway, I put it down and grew some more So it, and then chopped it, came back the next year and chopped it all up. So he had three grapevines along his fence, all pruned back. He was all concerned because after I'd finished, this thing looked decimated. It was all chopped up. He says, what have you done to my grapevine? I said, just wait and see. And that year, come along to church. He says, oh, pastor, you should see all the fruit. Do you want to come around and have some grapes? So I went round and feasted on a bit of his grapes, nice big bunches of grapes. You can't get grapes if you're not prepared to prune. You all know the church has a task, don't you? Are you twig to that yet? That our calling is to reach the whole community for Christ. Our calling is to make disciples of all nations. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And, you know, you're to make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. That does not mean that the job has finished once we've baptised people. That's when the job has started. That's we've started it because that's the beginning step of discipleship. So, we're supposed to be making disciples, which means a nurturing, it's a relationship, it's a walking alongside of people to help them discover who they are in Christ and what, what their job is. So often we think that there's this misunderstanding, I think, in the church. Well, there must be a misunderstanding because we're not growing. In fact, we're declining. The Christian church overall is declining in the West. You realise that, don't you? I don't have to pull statistics out, but we're declining. Uh, Christianity is still the fastest growing religion in the world, but um, in the West we are declining. Why are we declining? We've got all the resources at our disposal. We shouldn't be declining. Part of the problem, I think, is our misunderstanding of why we're here. We're not just here to baptise. We're here to make disciples. And so we need to prune. That's the hard bit, isn't it? We need to prune. It's to cut off let me just read that. I am the true vine, my father is the gardener. This is God's activity. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. See, this is my concern. Jesus says, I'm the vine. So Jesus is the vine. He's the thing. He's the main deal here. And we are the branches. Right, we stick out from Jesus. My Father, God, is the gardener. He cuts off everything in me, that's in Jesus, cuts off everything that does not That's my concern. If we as the church are not bearing fruit, you have to put the ing on there, but if we're not, well you could say bear fruiting, depending on, but if we're not bearing fruit, can we be cut off? In Jesus' own words, that's the danger. Let's resolve here and now to be fruit bearers. We'll go, oh, I don't know how to do that. Does this mean I have to go and knock on my neighbour's door and say, have you ever heard about Jesus? No. Um, okay, let's not get too scared about this. 
um, it may work very well be. That's what you are called to do. But the f- there's a first step. We ourselves need to cut off things that are not bearing fruit. We need to ask the question, what are we doing in our church life and in our individual life? What are we doing as a church corporately or individually as individual Christians? And, there's, and we can't separate the two because individual Christians are part of the church. But what are we doing corporately and individually that does not bear fruit? So speaking negatively first. Let's look at everything that we do, corporately and individually, and ask the question, why are we doing this? Is this bearing fruit? And if it's not, why are we doing it? If we're doing something, we're putting all this effort into organising something or, or running something or having this function going on, and... If it's not bearing fruit, why? Why are we doing it? Now maybe it's an essential thing like meeting for, together on, for worship on a Sunday and we say, well, we ask the question, if this is not bearing a lot of fruit, why, how can we change it so that it does? These are essential questions and if, we, if we're not prepared to make those changes, then you know, think about that. Pruning happens. God is doing that pruning. So we need to think about our fruitfulness and how we can do that. All right, you all scared? Good, excellent, fine. Love a scared church. No, it's... Uh, We need to look at not just the problems but the questions. Look, we know that there is huge work to do in our society, don't we? We know there are huge problems with our society and the people, you know, we only have to look at our own families and we see suffering, we see waywardness, we see hopelessness, we see all sorts of difficulty. We know there are huge things that need doing. We need a start, we need a good plan, we need something that's going to lead us down the path of bearing fruit. Um, on the 22nd of May I'm going to be running that's the day before Pentecost so the Saturday I'm going to be running a. well we're going to be running an evangelism seminar it's going to be a day long thing where we come and talk about how we can what we can do to share our faith outside of ourselves so this is just the basics I want to have one of these every year and our first one is just going to be talking about how can I be involved in sharing faith outside of my own little four walls? Now, I've called it unscary evangelism for the purpose of I want to remove the scariness from it. I want to remove the impossibility because it is possible. It's got to be possible because that's what Jesus calls you into. By virtue of your birthright, you are an evangelist. You are a bearer of good news for the world. Let's get together and just see how that works. So that's what we want to do on the 22nd. But I want to send you away with the good news that Jesus is working to bring about fruit in your life. Now you may not know how how that works and, and you may be going, well, I'm suffering so many things. Well, maybe you're just being pruned a bit. Maybe God is working uh, to to bring fruit out of you through the hard time you're going through right now. Maybe that's what's happening. And quite possibly it is because that's what Jesus is talking about here Um, when he says, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that we'll be even more fruitful. Okay, and no branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. So because we are in the vine, our destiny is fruitfulness. Just, it's just because that's what vines do. Right? That's just what we do as children of God, is bear fruit. I pray that 
you'll go away from here disturbed at the lack of fruitfulness in our church. Not just this one here, but in churches all over Australia. I pray that you can have a sense of of disruption in your life over that, maybe a bit of heartache. But I pray that also in you is even now growing some hope because God's intention is that we should be fruitful. And I invite you on a journey of fruitfulness to see where this leads us. Because God is calling us to reach out to the community and we will see blessing. We will be blessed. Because that's how God... You know, think of the advantage... I mean, the, the example of the, uh, you know, the knowing the Father's business, being invited into the Father's business. Sure, it's a, big, it's a big corporation, it's a big job, but there is great blessing. The bigger the corporation, the bigger the job, the bigger the blessing. We've got the biggest job, the biggest corporation in the universe. So the biggest blessing. Let's look forward to those blessings because, because God is about to bless you. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and always. Amen. We're going to sing a song, so I've been told or so I suspect. Uh, but while that happens, I want to pray for people. Um, so I'm going to be over here somewhere. I'll just be out of camera shot, right, so that uh, you can come down the front without um, feeling like this is going out to the world. Uh, but also, if you feel that you would like to, um, to be prayed for for some reason, maybe you want to jump on the back of this little healing wave that's, being, that's rippling through our church right now. Maybe you want to uh, uh, be, be blessed with with this development of the calling within you. Maybe you, want, maybe you feel the need to be pruned or maybe you are being pruned. Uh, I want to pray for you. I want to pray blessing on your life. Uh, I want to pray healing into your life. So let's uh, get that happening.